Hello, welcome to Crossroads Pre-Show. My name is Aisha, and I thought I would take an opportunity to tell you about some really cool things that are happening at Crossroads before we get started. So one, I am so excited about Stuff the Truck Food Drive right here. Oh my goodness, it's amazing. So this is actually the very last day that we are doing this. We've been doing this for a couple of weeks. So if you're around, you could definitely run down some groceries or a better option might be to go to our store at crossroadscolorado.com slash store and you can actually donate different amounts of bags or choose your own amount to donate and then boom, you're in. I just got the latest statistics and I found out that we are actually ahead of last year. Hi, Ryan. Hey. Welcome, welcome. Hey, thank you. We I apologize. I, I think it was five minutes. And I'm out there talking to one of our wonderful greeters, spilling coffee everywhere. <laughs> but please. <laughs> it is okay. I think that gr greeting our uh, our volunteers and our guests is the highest priority. Right, so we're ahead of last year. We're ahead of last year. So it turns out we're at, so every dollar donated is like a pound donated, a pound of food. And so we're at 4,300 pounds when you consider money and in the middle of a pandemic. In the middle of a pandemic. So I say 4,300, what? Why doesn't this service take it to the next level? So if you are at awesome. home or if you are right here and you have your cell phone, I say, hey, hop onto that Crossroads color. <laughs> I'm sorry, the struggle is real over here with the, with the no, coffee. What is wrong with me? <laughs> There's a hole in his lip today, people. That is okay. Anyways, we're really excited for this. Um, so, yeah, we're just here connecting. I see all kinds of people coming in. So very exciting. Yes. This is great. I love it. Um, you know, uh, earlier you shared with me something really fun and, and special that you got to do this week. Yes. If the coffee problem resolves itself, oh, it's could good. you share? I'm burning myself here. <laughs> like, I'm still in. No. The, um, yeah, so I have, like, I grew up in... I grew up in, and my dad was a pastor, so we moved quite a bit. But in sixth grade, we moved to Indianapolis. And that was kind of where I spent junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. And we, I met some friends in junior high, one in elementary school, really. And we've known each other since then. So I was like 11 or 12. And like four years ago, five years ago, I had this epiphany that I had no friends. Gosh. Like I went to a conference and the person was talking about like friendships. And I realized like I have a lot of acquaintances and people in my life that I'm friendly to that I enjoy, but they're always a transaction, especially in my line of work. Like I was, I was their pastor, or I was their employer, or it was, there, I worked for them. They were part of the board. And, and these were people that I enjoyed. But at the end of the day, you just knew like if they left the church or if I left it, like that relationship was going to shift. And I realized like I'm going to be 65, 70 years old and I'm not going to have anybody to like hang out with and like, so I called these three friends. We were all in each other's weddings. And I said, for the rest of our lives, I suggest we get together one weekend a year and just connect and because I, I need you in my life. Yeah. And so we've done that. And so this was like our fourth year. I think we missed one year because of my move. It was my fault. But and we just spent three days together. We, I, they, they came into Colorado and we COVID, very COVID safe, stayed in a cabin and cooked and did some hiking and... And it was great to see them. And I love that fellowship. I love it. They're just brothers, you know. And and it's a unique it's a unique relationship. It's, yeah. There's no. They want nothing from me. Well, I say I want nothing from them, but I'm always fundraising from them. I'm always <laughs> like, we get this great project. You know, your business is doing well, right? Come on, write a check. <laughs> well, but. you know, sharing is caring, as I tell my seven year old. I like that. There you go. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. Um, the connection with friends. And I think that's a part of what being a part of a church is too. And at least Absolutely. for me, it's about that connection. Yeah. Um, and I've made so many great friends here over the years. And, um, but it's a friendly place. It too. Is. Like, I want to say that, like, I, I mean, I joke around sometimes, but like, I really did have a privilege of working with a lot of churches and being around a lot of places in my career. And there is a, even in a pandemic, our atrium has an energy to it that's so genuine, yeah. it, even seven feet apart. And it's and I could see how, I mean, you just meet people here who have been a part of this community for so long, and they just like each other right. and love each other. And it's great. No, it's, I, it's, I totally hear what you're saying. It's a special place. Friendship is important. I like how you called your friends brothers. Yeah. Um, and I have, a, I have a group of girlfriends that we've known each other, oh my goodness, since at least high school. And when I was going through a rough time, they really were there for me, probably in a way of just like day-to-day -day caring. Yeah. 
And um, I got them all bracelets that say um, something to the effect of um, not sisters by blood, but sisters by soul. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you know, and so I'm like, oh, do yeah. I, 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 do I have to buy them jewelry You do, now? you absolutely do, <laughs> especially if they're donating. Maybe a hat, Habit of Hope is your hat. But it's interesting because we're walking through these seasons in life that are just different. Like mm -hmm. most of us, our kids are now like late teens. One is in college. Um, my, one of my friends, his father passed away last year. And so it's like you, these experiences that you're like, you, it, it's just great to have those folks. I high, but it, I learned it takes investment. It's investing. Absolutely. You, know, you have like for us, they live in all different parts of the country. Yep. So it's, it's this like, okay, we're going to coordinate and we're going to get this worked out and we're going to, you know, it's, we're going to do it. And but it's just that intention that people Absolutely. have to take. Yeah, my girlfriends and I, we have a, a monthly uh, get together, but it's been over Zoom for the last yeah. eight months. But it's always the same, you know, date of the month at the same time. Yep. And um, that's helped keep us connected. So, good. so it's very cool. Well, speaking of connection, we are about to connect with a really cool uh, vision weekend. I'm so excited for this. I'm um, having previously heard both the video and the live. <laughs> Having had to suffer <laughs> through it twice. No, it, it's amazing. It's actually worth, I actually caught so much more live, mm. you know, than, than in the video that I was like, oh yeah, and I just love your connection to scripture. So I'm really excited for what we're about to hear. Um, before that, we are also going to hear from our incredible worship team. I really believe that we have yeah. the, one of the best worship teams in Northern Colorado, job. at least if not even all of Colorado. Um, I love their music. I love what they do. I love it live. I love it when they're out in these cool locations all over Northern Colorado recording for us. So oh, right now we are going to hear from them and it's going to be the goodness of God. I'm so excited. Oh, I love that song. Yep. I love it. Very yeah. good. All right. Heck. Good. 
praise for that like let's that is so good to hear live music all right well welcome back um, everyone and we are so glad to see you today um, also welcome to those of you on the live cast joining us my name is Aisha and wherever you are we are so glad to have you I am super super excited to announce this really cool thing that we have going on um, so you might be like me and you like to decorate, you know, for the holidays a little early, may or may not already have your Christmas tree up. No, anybody, anybody, anybody out there? No. Okay. Just me. All right. Well, you know, that's always fun. So, um, starting the Sunday after Thanksgiving, it is Advent season. It is the 12 days of Christmas. And as a church, we are going to be experiencing our maybe quieter Christmas, celebrating the slowing down of the season. Um, by reading daily readings and reflections from this book, Walter Brueggemann's Celebrating Abundance Devotions for Advent. I am so excited. I've thumbed through it. I got it on Thursday. I'm like, okay, don't start reading it early. Just, just wait for the whole church. We can, we can do this, Aisha. Uh, it's $10 out in the atrium here at the uh, Taft Avenue campus, so I recommend you guys join us in that. Um, it's going to be amazing. Also, I want you to check out our gather page online for details on all of our gatherings. There you're going to find weekly resources like the digital connect card, links to our talk notes, online giving, and on-demand videos. So you can find it at crosswordscolorado.com slash gather. Now, I mentioned the digital connect card, but if you're in the room, you'll have received a packet of handouts that includes the paper connect card. The Connect card, either digital or paper, is the best way to stay in touch. So right here, everyone has this. So it's a way that, um, the, to say you are part of our global network. Now, if you're in the room, this is very important because this uh, is the way that we would use to contact trace if the situation arise. So what I'd love for everyone to do is just take out a pen, write your name, write your phone number at the very least, and then you're going to pop it in the Hope is Here orange kiosk on your way out. All right, guys, we are so excited. We're going to hear more from our Crossroads brand, band, Crossroads band, Hope has a name. There is a song, I know it well. A melody that's never fell On mountains high or valleys low My soul will rest my confidence in you alone Hope has a name, his name is Jesus my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised. I have victory. There is a light. Salvation. Christ undefeated, trampled the grave, seen on the cross, being lifted high. The light has won, the light has won, behold.
home in glory, your face I'll see. My pain no more, my fear will cease. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ my King. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ my King. season of life in the history of our world where we need to name hope. We need to name hope. I just wanted to take a moment. We're headed into a week that's going to be a tough week for a lot of people. It's going to be a tough week because it's going to be a Thanksgiving, uh, maybe without family because of COVID that you're used to being with. And it might be a tough week because this past year you've lost someone who usually sits at your Thanksgiving table. And so we want to take a moment and just pray for this week and pray for our community. Would you join me? Lord, thank you for this moment that we have to connect with one another in our own homes and here at the Taft Avenue campus. We thank you that you are present with us in our suffering, that you are an all-suffering God, that you took on flesh and walked and experienced loss and pain and hurt, and you showed us how to be human. You showed us how to love. So we pray for your presence to be felt in our lives in unique ways this week. As we walk into a season that usually is filled with joy and hope and laughter and eating and friends and family, and it's different. And so God, would you wrap your arms of hope and grace and love around us? Will you give us opportunities to be family, to people that are close by, to neighbors in unique ways, to our families in unique ways in this season? We pray for our community, we pray for our leaders, we pray for our governor. We pray, God, that you would give wisdom to our national leaders, Lord. We pray that you'd give us the humility, give us the patience, the tolerance, Lord, that's needed to walk in these difficult seasons. We thank you so much for the gift of faith. Be with us today. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears to all that you'd have for us, whether we're sitting in our pajamas at home, having some orange juice or brunch, or whether we're here at Taft Avenue, Shape us, make us more like you, Jesus, so that when we leave this place, we might be light and hope in spaces that oftentimes are dark and hopeless. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being here. I know um, some of you, if you're here in Northern Colorado, uh, particularly in our county, uh, you know that things are changing on Tuesday. We're going to moving to level red and you're wondering, you're sitting there going, what's happening with church next week? How many of you are wondering that right now? Like, what should I do next week? Good. That's where we like to keep you. Just on your toes. When you figure it out, let me know. And uh, so listen, um, here's the thing. We really aren't sure where we're going to be next week and how we're going to be doing this thing. But we will be doing it in some way, shape, or form. We're going to talk to the... um, the uh, health department, which is what we did at the last change, and we want to function in a way that uh, gets the blessing of the health department. We know 
that the God of the universe who sustains all things is not so temperamental that if we don't gather in this space, God loses God's mind and falls off the throne. Okay, we know that. All right? Um, and so I just want to encourage you that we will be disappointed if something like that happens and we need to hit the pause button on in-person gatherings, but we want to be safe and uh, we won't want to do anything that our health department and human services would say. No way. All right? So here's what you can do. Uh, if you're here in northern Colorado and Loveland you, and you're thinking about where do I go, what time are the broadcasts going to be, just watch the website. Check out the feed. If you haven't signed up for the feed, you can do that on the website, crossroadscolorado.com. If you're into Facebook, we have a Facebook page. You can check it out there and watch for that. We'll also send an email. On your digital connect card, if you just make sure your email is on there or on your regular card, make sure your email is up to date. Check that box, regular attender. You go into a regular attender group and all of our information that we email out goes out to that group. So it's kind of an important thing. I'm really not trying to control your life with the Connect card, I promise. I mean, there's other ways I'm trying to control your life. The Connect card isn't one of them. So you really, you don't need to worry about that, Penn Halbers. All right, don't even sweat it. Not trying to control you that way. All right. Um, okay, so lots of stuff happening. We're walking into the Christmas season and we are not going to let a pandemic stop us. All right. We're not going to let that happen. So we're exciting. We're going to shift and adapt and do what we have to uh, so that we can make the most of this season. There's lots of stuff happening around the Crossroads Colorado Network. Check it out, even at home. Welcome to Vision Weekend, where we're pumped up with possibility and preparing for a holiday season like none other. I'm Katie Martinez, and here's what's happening in northern Colorado and across the network. We're entering into the most wonderful time of the year. And isn't it interesting that what we call the holiday season happens during a time of darker days and colder weather. Most of the trees are now bare, outdoor dining is basically over, and December 21st is the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. Some time ago, I learned to appreciate the power of winter darkness, and I began associating winter time with some of life's most important movements. While things above ground are looking dormant and bleak, beneath the earth, new life is always growing in the safe sanctuary of darkness. This year in 2020, the joy of abundance in winter means even more to me, not only in my own house, but also in our Crossroads household of faith. And I believe that beneath the surface of this pandemic bleakness, God is growing fresh vision and commitment for the future of our dreams. The time is now. So whoever you are and wherever you are, sit back and listen to every word of this weekend vision message from Pastor Ryan Howell. Now, if you're wondering just how church is going to work during a holiday season of COVID madness, you are not alone, but don't let it worry you. We're planning a full holiday calendar of flexible online and in-person festivities to take us all the way through December to candlelight Christmas services and 12 days beyond. And yes, there will be a Jingle Fest drive-by party for families. Sunday, December 6th, a lot of other surprises coming in December. Well, finally, a word about the power of your generosity. Yesterday, while unpacking groceries, one of my daughters said, you know, every time I'm buying food, it triggers a sadness in my heart about everyone who's suffering during this pandemic. And she and I agreed that one powerful thing we can do is be a regular financial contributor to some peacemaking effort that's helping people now. Well, here at Crossroads Together, we are feeding the hungry and we're partnering with our neighborhood school to support vulnerable families. And we provide spiritual and mental health resources in all kinds of ways. And we can scale this work to help more and more people if we have the resources. You can become a contributor today by setting up a recurring donation. Just text the word Crossroads to 77977. Well, thanks for sharing part of Vision Weekend with us, and please take care of yourself and the people you love. All right. Well, hey, everybody in the room, and if you're watching at home, I point at this camera. I have no idea if that's the one that's 
facing me or not, or if it's this one, I don't know. We're low tech. We don't have a little light to tell me. But uh, we're doing communion today at the end of our uh, time together. So if you're at home at some point while I'm chatting, if you don't already have a snack or something to drink or eat in front of you, when you get bored, go grab a little snack and come back. Maybe it'll be better. Uh, If you're in the room uh, at some point where you start to drift off and think, wrap it up, Ryan. If you don't have one of these, you can go and grab uh, there on the tables in the back, and then at the end, we'll have somebody bring it by. Now, some of you that are really eager for communion, I'm going to say this now uh, because you will jump the gun later on, and then you'll regret it because these little puppies are a joy to open, okay? So much fun. (laughs) So here's the deal. When you open this, there's, a, there's two layers on the top. One's like a little cellophane. I don't know how, we're not going to zoom in, but you want to pull that cellophane layer off first. It's really thin. Then take the lid off the juice. If you take the lid off the juice, you get no bread. There's just no way to reopen it, and you'll be very frustrated and probably leave the church. Okay, so <laughs> do that, okay? So uh, we're going to do that later on. I don't know what to do with this, so I'm going to go set it over here. All right. Uh, Listen, we're wrapping up a series called Hope is uh, Open. My name is Ryan, the lead pastor. If you're a guest this morning, if you stumbled your way in during this uh, Thanksgiving week, thank you for being here. And and I'm glad you're here. If you're tuning in online, maybe somebody invited you to come and be a part of this. uh, That's great. You're going to get a big idea of where we believe we're headed as an organization, as a gathered church for the next 10 years. And uh, if you're a part of like any kind of strategic planning and any kind of organization, you know that there's a measure of foolishness in thinking about 10 years from now. But we have a big dream and we believe that we can focus and think about three years and one year plans and those kinds of things. But we want to share with you, I want to share with you today what that is. And it's kind of a culmination of the last seven weeks. Uh, You'll hear things that we talked about over the last seven weeks and how it all fits together. And some of you are probably like, finally, maybe this will make some sense. We put it all together. Uh, I don't know. But uh, that's what we're going to do today. This series, we've been focusing around this thing that Jesus said, this statement, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And we've been imagining what would it look like to ground our understanding of God and faith and church in this big word of peacemaker, peacemaker. That the language of faith, the language of religion has at times in, in recent history and throughout history, it's like pushed people away. And we've, we've gotten used to words and words have been used to uh, kind of control and manipulate people. And what if we could reframe it all around this idea of the call of the Christian life, right, that word, into a life that builds peace in the world. And peace is not just absence of conflict. Peace is actually this idea of wholeness, justice, mercy, humility. We've talked about these things. So that's what we want to do today. And uh, so we're going to jump in. Uh, Listen, about a few years ago, not a few years ago now, it was like 20 three years ago now, 22 years ago now, I graduated. And uh, I graduated from, uh, with my master's degree from a wonderful school, little school in Massachusetts called Harvard. And I was super excited. And I went to this school thinking, this is going to set me on a path. Uh, I'll go into debt and it'll be wonderful. Uh, and, and this will be worth it. And so the plan was move the family from uh, my, where we were working. And I was an undergraduate work. We were doing school in Springfield, Missouri, the most affordable place to live in the United States of America, to Cambridge. Massachusetts. Not the most affordable place to live in the United States of America, but we said, let's move out there. It'll be great. And so we move out, go to school. The plan was do the master's degree, get into a PhD program, work with students and young people, and then teach college and shape and fashion thinking around religion and ministry. That was the plan. I never thought I would do this right? I never thought this would be my job. I never thought I would be a senior pastor at a church. And some of you are like, you probably should have stayed with that plan, Ryan. That might have (laughs) saved all of us a heartache. But uh, this is where I am. But what happened was, what led me on this path uh, was I, so so, uh, you finish up, you're finishing up your semester, you start the process of applying to PhD programs. So I'm applying to programs, and my advisor is this kind of world-renowned scholar in Jewish history and theology and Judaism. And and he's he's working with me, and he, he sees this schools I'm applying, sees my recommendations. A direct quote from this man, who turns out, in my opinion, not to be as smart as everybody thinks he is, he said, you will definitely get into one of these programs. (laughs) It didn't happen. That's why I say I don't know if he's as smart as everybody thinks he is, right? But it didn't happen. So I applied to all these programs, and then for the next two months of my life, I waited to know where we were going to move next. Where was, what was the next step? Here's the plan. This is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. How, how's it going to work out? And one after the other, I got the letter that said, thanks, but no thanks. One after the other. 
And so all of a sudden, here I am, I'm graduating, and I have no future. And so we're all gathered there in Harvard Yard, which is this really pretty spectacular experience is, is commencement at Harvard you, they bring all the schools together because Harvard's one university. It uh, doesn't matter what school you're in, whether you're in the law school or theology or medical or if you're medicine, if you're in you know, education, master's programs, or if you're in the undergraduate, you all come together for one big commencement in the yard, and then you go to your schools. And it's this huge part. And I'm just going to tell you, that was the most depressing day of my life. Legitimately. Isn't that crazy to think about? And I know some of you are like, that's a first world problem, right? I totally get that. But in that moment where I was in my life, 22 years old, I didn't know what was next. Why did I just go into all this debt for? Why did we move all across the country? This isn't the plan. This is what I, and I didn't know. I, don't, I couldn't tell you much about that day because I really was genuinely so depressed. And I just felt like a failure. I wanted any degree than the one I was getting. I wanted to be any place than where I was. It was hard to even smile for pictures. And I felt on that day kind of like a stalled car on the side of the road a really expensive stalled car on the side of the road. <laughs> like one that I had just signed the lease for and I was really excited and this car was supposed to take me someplace and it was just stalled and it was, what was it all for? Because I really didn't care much about stuff like that, like, you know, prestige and degree. I didn't really care, but it was like, this was the path. This is what I was gonna do with my life in that sense. And, and the opportunity came. And, and as I look back on that moment in my life, I think it's a common moment that a lot of us feel and experience at some levels where we just feel life stalled, right? It's, it's not that it's bad, right? I mean, I wasn't in a bad place. Let's face it. I, I mean, I had a master's degree from a great school. Uh, I was going to be okay, right? But I had just stalled. I didn't know where I was going. What was I doing? And, and I realized as I think about that, that all of us, if we're kind of honest, we look at our lives, we have those moments where we just kind of stall out, and it's not that the car is unrepairable. It's not that it's, you know, it's, but we're just kind of broke down on the side of the road and we go, what's happening? And, and I think the truth is people as individuals, this happens to us. I think that businesses can go through seasons of that. And churches, we all can stall. It's not necessarily that we've done something wrong. I didn't feel like I did anything wrong other than just not being smart enough to get into these PhD programs, you know, overestimation of my own ability to think, I guess. I don't know. But like we just stall out and then we're stuck asking this question, well, how do we move forward? Like, how do we move forward from this? Where do we go forward? Well, you know, the nation of Israel found themselves in this very predicament. They, well, they didn't graduate from Harvard, but they were stalled out, right? They found themselves in a place where it was like, what do we move forward to? And actually they stalled for like 150 years. So in 586 BC, 2,500, 2,600 years ago, the Babylonians came into Jerusalem and they destroyed the city because the Israelites rebelled against their, the dominating king of the day. And they came in, destroyed the city, tore down the walls and took away, took captive, uh, forced out everybody, just about everybody, at least the best and the brightest. Took them to Babylon and said, here's where you'll live. And they then lived there for about 150 years. Some, a group came back 75 years later, but it was about 150 years that they lived in exile, generation after generation, wondering what was next. And in this culture, right, 2,500 years ago, in this culture, uh, your deity's power was based upon your military power, right? So what had been told to the Israelites by the Babylonians was... Hate to break the news to you guys, but your God isn't even real. Your God is so weak, your God couldn't even protect your God's own temple. And, they had, and the Israelites had a way of understanding it that didn't deflate God. They interpreted it as, well, we failed God and we received this as punishment, trying to make sense of their world, which we all do, right? But 150 years they lived, but 150 years after this, this guy named Nehemiah comes on the scene. And there's a book in the Bible named after Nehemiah, if you're new to Bible study. And it tells the story of this guy named Nehemiah who was functioning in about, you know, in the middle of the fifth century uh, BC. And he comes in on the scene and his family was probably deported from Jerusalem. Uh, and then he's probably born in captivity, a servant. And he kind of finds his way. But he's, his history is this 150 year stall. And he's actually a servant in the king of, of, the, of Persia at the time, because what happened was the Babylonians lost power to the Persians. The Persians took control. And so now he's a servant in the palace of the Persian king, 150 years. I don't know that Nehemiah honestly had ever even been to Jerusalem. I would kind of doubt it. I would doubt he'd ever been to Jerusalem. You got to imagine, just think, what do you know about 150 years ago in your own like firsthand knowledge from relatives, let's say, in your own family? I mean, that's 
it's quite a ways away from our kind of memory. But it's interesting, it says in Nehemiah chapter 1, that Nehemiah all of a sudden, like he just decided to find out what was going on. And he was working in the capital at the time, Susa was the capital of Persia, uh, which is in uh, uh, modern day Iraq. So he sees there, and he's kind of wondering like, what's going on? What's going on? And so one of his brothers shows up and he brings him in and, and some other men from Judah, which is the, the nation where Jerusalem sat. And he asks him about the Jews, his people, his ancestors that are living there. 150 years later, they call them the remnant. They're still in their homeland. He says, what's going on there? And they answered him, Nehemiah says, uh, the survivors of the captivity there in the province are in great distress and under reproach. And they said, the wall of Jerusalem has been breached. Its gates gutted by fire. And it's funny that they talk about this like it happened yesterday. <laughs> The first time it happened 150 years ago. And then there might have been an attempt at a rebuild maybe 50 years earlier than this that didn't go very well, like it was ransacked again. So at best, 50 years. But it's like it just happened yesterday. And it says, Nehemiah says, when I heard this report, I began to weep. And I continued mourning for several days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And in, in Nehemiah's response, I think we learn the first thing that happens when you want to get unstalled. We see that Nehemiah had a burden. He got a burden for his people, right? He wanted to find out. All of a sudden, he was just wondering, what's going on with my ancestors there in Jerusalem? And he asked the question because a burden had welled up inside of him for his people. And then it goes on in chapter 2 of this same book, Nehemiah. It says a few months later, Nehemiah is there serving the king. And he was the one who brought the wine out. He was in charge of the wine. So this meant he was the, called the king's cup bearer, right? Which meant they would bring the wine in, he would taste it, make sure it wasn't poisoned. And then if it wasn't poisoned, he would live and give it to the king and he'd get to do this the next day, right? I mean, it, it was a great job in a sense that he lived within the palace confines and as far as being a servant goes, good deal. But overall, like you mess up, like you, you displease the king, he'll just kill you, right? And if somebody's trying to kill the king, they got to go through you first, you know, the poison. So it's not like the best deal in the world. And, and so it says he's there in charge of the wine and he took some of the wine and he offered it to the king. But because he had never before been sad in the king's presence, the king asked Nehemiah this question, why do you look so sad? If you're not sick, you must be sad at heart. And this is a very interesting depiction of the king uh, of, uh, uh, of Persia because you wouldn't, you wouldn't normally hear uh, a captive people record such a kind of what appears to be a tender experience, right? But what happens is he just knows it, like, because everybody around the king is always acting like, well, everything's wonderful because they don't want to die. And Nehemiah says, though I was seized with great fear, I answered the king. Now, he's seized with fear because if he's in the king's presence and he looks sad, down, depressed, the king could just be like, get this guy out of here. I don't want anything to do with him. And, you know, at best, he'd never see him again and he'd be cast into a dungeon. At worst, he'd be killed or maybe vice versa, right? And so in that moment, he's seized with fear, but he answers the king. He says, I've got this moment. And he's, had, he's got this burden that's been inside of him. He says, may the king live forever. How could I not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates consumed by fire? I think what we see here is that Nehemiah had a passion for his city, right? Not just did he have a burden for his people, but he also had a passion for this place. There was something about this place in his life that he knew his ancestors were there and it was in ruin and he he had developed such a passion that it actually changed his behavior. He put himself at risk. And then it says the king asked Nehemiah, well, what is it then that you wish? It's a very interesting moment. Like, so now now Nehemiah is asked like, well, what do you want? What can I do for you? I don't think Nehemiah was ready for this, (laughs) right? Because Nehemiah Nehemiah says, I prayed to the God of heaven (laughs) first, right? Like you could just imagine in his mind, like, Oh, I wasn't expecting that. What should I say, God? What should I say? Like the panic. Have you ever done that? Like you have this moment where you're like, uh, you know, so he's praying inside of his mind. He's like, what do I do? And then he answers the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant is deserving of your favor, send me to Judah. Send me to Judah to the city where my ancestors are buried that I may rebuild it. And what we see here is not only did he have a burden for his people, a passion for his city, but he had a vision for his future, right? He could see better for himself. That, yeah, he had this responsibility to care for the wine and take up the wine. But he said, I could see better for myself. And he had the courage to act and to ask. And so what is vision? I like to think of vision as God's preferred future. 
God's preferred future. God's preferred future for your life is God's vision for your life. God's preferred future for my life is God's vision for my life. God's preferred, uh, God's vision for our church is God's preferred future for our church. And we actually, like, I don't believe that vision is something that just happens and then we live it out and go, that's what God wanted for my life. Like, I, I don't believe that. And you might've even heard people say, well, nothing can stop God's plan for your life. And that sounds wonderful, but it's just not true. Like, I'm just going to tell you that right now because I love you enough. Like, if you're sitting at home and you're thinking, well, God has a plan for my life and nothing can stop it, you're living under a delusion. Because there is a person who can stop God's plan for your life. You know who that is, right? You. (laughs) You can stop God's plan for life. I do believe that no one else, right? I believe we can actually stop God's plan for our life. We can stop God's plan for our future. Like, Nehemiah could have been like, oh, That is way too risky. I don't have anything to do with that nonsense. And step out of this preferred vision, this preferred future that God had for him. But he didn't. He stepped into it. And we hear from the story through the next three or four chapters of Nehemiah that Nehemiah gets to go back. It's funded by the Persians. It's crazy what happens. And Nehemiah starts with the walls. He takes on the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, the city that rebelled against the prior administration, right, the Babylonians. He rebuilds the fortified walls of this city. And it says in Nehemiah chapter 6 that the work of the wall was finished, and it took 52 days to do. Got everybody there, got it. And ultimately, what we see is Nehemiah had success. That this vision that Nehemiah believed was for his life, that God had for him, that started with a burden, developed with a passion, then he got an idea for it, and then he actually went and did it, made the sacrifices, faced the enemies, did all the work. It became successful. The work of God was completed. And here's the point, and here's what I think is powerful for our lives and for our church, is that when we stall, right, we just can't get the ignition going. I think we see in Nehemiah that a burden, passion, and vision That's the ignition system for God's successes in this world, right? It's not just that we say, well, God do this and then God magically does things. No, God always seeks people who are willing to carry the burden, live out the passion and see the vision, see the future and work towards it, right? That's what God does. When God wants to accomplish God's work in this world, there's always this understanding that God is looking for a willing vessel, a willing church, a willing person to say, I'll bear the burden because I have a passion and I'll believe that God has a preferred future in this arena. So what about us? What about you? What about our church? I wanna focus the next few moments that we have together. I'll have you out of here by kickoff. Don't worry about that. Um, uh, Which is the four o'clock game, right? Is that the four? No? It's the two o'clock. Oh, what what time zone am I in? I'm still thinking East Coast. It's two o'clock here, isn't it? Oh, man. We have to cut some of this out. Okay. So I want to talk about this as it relates to us as a church. Everybody just, if you're at home, just start clapping. If you're in the room, just start clapping like you're excited about it, even if you're not. Just clap. Okay, good. Wonderful. If you're at home, you should hear the excitement in the room right now. Everybody's a buzz about this. All right. So here's the thing. All right. I want to spend the next, next few minutes that we have together very quickly walking through this vision. But I want to start with the burden. It's my belief as we kind of walked through over these last months, really, uh, a year ago, we started asking these questions, like, what is it that God has for us? How do we talk about this good news of Jesus? How do we do this in a way that, that builds on what has happened over the last 24 years? And then we've spent the last two or three months, hours and hours and hours of talking and praying and discerning and working together as, as a leadership that's here to serve our congregation And so here's the things that I think you've experienced over these last seven weeks, but I want to try and distill it and bring it together. The burden. So if Nehemiah had a burden for his people, who are our people as a church? We believe that God has given us this burden for those that are spiritually dissatisfied, disenfranchised, and disconnected. That there's something in their spiritual life that says, I'm not satisfied where I am, but I'm disconnected from it. The church has disenfranchised me. I haven't given up on the idea of God, but I've given up on the idea that I could actually be part of a community because they won't accept me or because I have to believe all of this or I have to see it this way, whatever it might be. And so there's these wanderings. And we talked about this group that results in the nuns and the nevers and never agains. But that's the burden that is weighing in. And here's the thing. This is an articulation of the burden that started this place. Almost 25 years ago, 
this place was started with a group of people who sat in the living room and talked about creating a church that neighbors would want to go to. That's a burden for the spiritually disenfranchised, the spiritually disconnected. And we believe that burden is staying the same. And so now we're saying, okay, that burden has put a passion in us for something, right? So right now, what does that mean? Well, 25 years ago, it really did mean like we got to create a church experience that people want to go to, right? I mean, because I don't know if you know this now, but you go look back 25 years ago, like, I don't know how to say this without feeling like I'm being mean. I don't mean to be mean, but I grew up in the church. Remember, I'm allowed to do this. Like, it's my life. Like, church was boring. I just don't have a better way to say it. <laughs> like, church was boring, and it was done in ways that just didn't connect to your everyday life. Like, the music didn't connect to it. The, the visualization of it didn't connect to it. It was just, it was just, it, it just, people were like, eh, I'm out. And so we have this wonderful movement within Christianity of like, wait a second, like how do we adjust our methods and become more modernized in the way we do things? It was beautiful and needed and necessary. And we see that movement happen. And now we have churches all over the world, all over America that have quote unquote modernized their methodology. So you come in and there's coffee and there's a band and there's lights that move. You know, those lights will move like, it's crazy. And that was important because the big barrier was boredom. For a lot of people, the big barrier was, I don't know, it doesn't have any, I don't get it, right? So now we're saying, okay, well, here we are 25 years later. What's the big barrier for this same group? But, and that's the passion, right? So the passion is to, that we feel God's drive is to share this message of a more Christ-like God. Like to actually think about how do we actually express and understand and, and convey the reality of God in a Christ-like way. Because if our version of God, if what we're teaching about God doesn't look like Jesus, then we have a problem. So how do we do that? How do we shape that? And what that means is how do we then share the good news of Jesus like it's good news for everyone? Not just the people who can believe every doctrine, not just the people that interpret the Bible this way, but how do we do this, right? How do we stop, it? How do we stop conveying the good news as if there's bad news? Have you ever done that? Like, have you ever heard that one? I did. I grew up in that one, right? Right? People say, I want to tell you the good news about Jesus, right? They say, Mike, I need to share with you the good news about Jesus. But first, I got to tell you the bad news. You're going to burn in hell. <laughs> like, can we get to the good news, right? And then we present the good news, right? Now, again, my statement is this. Like, if we're present, like, that's never, like, in a sense, I have to say, wait a second. Is that really good news? Are we portraying a God of love that says, if you don't love me, if you don't follow me, if you don't believe the way I tell you to believe, then I can't stand to be around you and I have to punish you for all of eternity. There's something about that that we intrinsically look at the life of Jesus and go, oh, hold on a second, it doesn't make sense. And so how do we actually present this good news? Like, it's all good news. You just have to believe it. That's the crazy thing about the message of Jesus, in my humble opinion, is that there really isn't any bad news other than we're kind of under a lie that there's bad news. We're kind of under a lie that we're separated from God. But the good news is you're not. <laughs> and how will they know unless they're told? Right? That's what it says. Now, it doesn't say how will they make a choice. It just says how will they know? How will they know unless they're told? I love that that passage does not say... How will they be able to make a choice to burn in hell or to have eternity in heaven? These two places, one's below and one's above. This was the common belief 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years Like, not even that. It wasn't really. But like, but it isn't how will they make a good, wise choice. It's how will they know the good news of Jesus, that you are loved by God, that you were created by God, that God has a plan for your life, and that religion doesn't matter. That's crazy. <laughs> That what you do at the end of the day doesn't, you are loved by God. And that love transforms you and affects what you do, right? So how do we do that? And that's the passion that I think this church has been developing and been living out of as I listened and we discerned for a long time. And now we're just trying to say, this is our passion. How do we do that? And now here's how we live that out. And here's how I think this church has always lived it out and why I'm so privileged to be a part of it, right? The way we live out this passion to present the good news, like it's good news for everybody, is we say things like this. We're a church that looks for wisdom, not answers and rules in the Bible. That the Bible offers us a path of wisdom, that God gives us wisdom through scripture. We see people working out how to live a life that's faithful to love in their time. But if we try to just take the rules of the Bible and apply them to our lives, oh my goodness, the pain that will come from that. 
And if we try to go to the Bible with our answers, like, what should I do with this? Like, should I eat lobster? You know, find the verse and no. Should I eat barbecue? Find the verse. No. I mean, Colorado's out at that point. I'm going to tell you that right now. So we don't see the Bible as this rule book. We don't see the Bible as a book that has all the answers. We see it as a struggle. And it's the beauty of the struggle. It's about maturity and wisdom and growth. God, as one author put it, is not a helicopter parent hovering over us, swooping down, giving us all the answers, and then swooping out of the way and being angry if we don't get right. No, God is letting us mature as humanity, not just as individuals, but as a whole human collective conscious. So that's one of the things. Another way that we live out this passion is that we love everyone. We truly love everyone by including everyone. Fully including everyone, regardless of race, gender, sexuality, class, disability, immigration status, Jesus is Lord is what unites us. What unites us will never be our race. What unites us will never be our sexuality. What unites us will never be our immigration status or our class. That it will never unite us. What unites us is that God loves each and every one of us exactly the same. And that what unites us as people in leadership and in work is that we profess Jesus is Lord. Now, we all interpret that a little differently, but that's the first ancient creed. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. In other words, Jesus and his way is what, I got, what guides my life, is where I bend my knee, not to any other leadership. That phrase was definitely developed specifically in political revolt to what Caesar and what, what all of the leaders in Rome were wanting people to do in terms of deify them and follow them. And it was a statement that, no, this is my path, right? And so we're passionate about fully including people, and that costs us. And it costs us. So we choose to extend grace and love and mystery, and, 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 and we say we just are gonna, we're always going to err on the side of including people and loving people. Another way that we live this passion out is that we talk about an ever-evolving understanding of God. We're not a static place. This place is not a static, like, we figured everything out about God. Here's the 17 things you need to believe, and then you're all set. And don't ever question them. And if you question them, then you're just going to need to go someplace else. Like, that's not this place. The beauty of this place is we believe that our understanding of God is ever-evolving. That we're learning more and more about God through science. We're learning more and more about God through reality, what God has placed right in front of us. If God is the creator of the universe and has established things that create and is, and is working and sustaining, then we cannot just tolerate science, right? We can actually say science actually reveals something to us of God. And so we get this beautiful understanding, but we ground that if evolution in the person of Jesus, the Christ, the eternal Christ, and what we call the perennial tradition. And the perennial tradition is just a philosophical term that is lived out in saying that we're not, like, like there is truth that's bigger than any one denomination. There's truth that's bigger than any one religion. And those truths that are bigger than all of us are the perennial tradition, are really the kingdom of God. And so we hold that point. Because if we don't have a point to stand on, if we just say, well, our understanding of God is always changing, we're just going to float around. So we have to have a point to stand on. And our point is this Christian tradition grounded in Jesus. And that makes us unique. And so that's how we can talk about the Good News Survey. That's why we can question things and say, is this really what God wants for us? Is this really what, how we should understand God today? And, we also, and what this means is that as a community of faith, we recognize that there is power in mystery and danger in certainty. If we are so certain of everything that we believe in, every way, thing, way that we interpret Scripture, there's no room for mystery. There's no room for what we would call faith. And it's when we get certain about something that we start to exclude, that we get angry, that we kill, that we're violent. We see this at all levels. But mystery, right, it just keeps us humble. I, I can't possibly understand the God of the universe. But God invites me to wrestle with the mystery over and over again and to find hope in that. And so I can sit with anybody and talk about understandings of God, and I say, well, I'm grounded in this Jesus way of thinking, so that's my point, but let's talk. This passion lives out to bring the good news like it's good news for everybody. Is we want our guests and everybody that is like a beneficiary of our ministry, our church together, we want them to experience the core values of who we are as a church. And so we said, what are those things that we believe are our core values that guide us and direct us? The things that make us like we couldn't, 
We couldn't do work. We couldn't do ministry. We couldn't exist as a community in any other way because it's just who we are. And we went through this big, long, like, what are those things? And we thought of some of you, right? We pictured faces, like, who are the people that we look at and go, that's Crossroads. Like, that's the ideal, like their heart and the way that they've done year after year after year. And these are the things that we said, like, we're fun. Like, I just be honest, I made this decision 20 years ago that I was not ever, ever, ever going to engage in this work of faith and religion and church and not have fun doing it. Life's just too short. So we're just going to have fun while we do it. And that may like seem like, like sacrilegious. I don't know, but I just feel like fun is important. Let's just have fun while we do this. We, we value inclusion and that gets lived out. We value generosity. This church is generous. Our, our stuff, the truck. My goodness, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And and did you know this? You all are actually doing more for Stuff the Truck this year than you did last year. Can I just give you a dirty little secret? Like nobody wants to do this. Like pastors don't like to do this because it's always up and to the right in church world. Like never difficult times. Like I don't know if you know it or not, but like attendance is down. (laughs) Like if you're at home, like we're not packing the place out, Okay. Like attendance is down, giving is down, right? Like that's the reality, folks, okay? Like let's not hide it. Let's not, you know, I have friends that like when they ask me how things are going, I'm like, they're terrible. What are you talking about? Like, yeah, it's sugarcoated. Like there's horrible, I mean, there's very difficult problems. But in the midst of all of that, those of you that are connected right now, and we can talk about a series of vision because the majority of you that are connecting right now believe deeply in what this place stands for. And that's why it's a wonderful season for us to do this. If you're a guest and you're coming into this, you're kind of, I get it, you're like, what does that have to do with my everyday life? Well, not a lot right now. But like you all, we're at like basically the equivalency of like 4,500 pounds of food donated in the middle of a pandemic at like half of our connecting points, like what we can tell is that if we're lucky, we're having about half the number of people connecting and giving as we had a year ago, but you guys are crushing it. Why is that? Am I that good of a manipulator? I mean, I like to think so, but I don't think so, right? I'm just kidding. Because you're generous, because it's the spirit, it's the core of who we are, right? We're creative, right? I said earlier today, like, uh, how are we meeting next week? I don't know. I don't have any idea. But we're creative enough to figure it out. You've got a team of people that work here that love you so much. They, they, they come to work and they solve these problems to, to bring hope to you and to your families and friends. And so we'll figure it out. We'll be here somehow. That's the, but we're creative. It's a creative. I mean, look at this place. Look at who they hired. You can't say they're not creative. Right? <laughs> I mean, you can call it something else, I suppose, but... And wisdom, we value wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is this idea that we, we don't have all the answers. We're growing. We're always learning. We're humble, right? We're the no-know-it-all place, right? That's one of the things we talked about in this whole process. This is, a, this is for this service only, if you're watching right now. I didn't say this in the other ones. Like, one of the things we decided as a leadership team we wanted to promise is that we would have a no-know-it-all policy in our leadership, that we would never hire anybody or we would never put a volunteer in leadership that doubt they knew it all. We don't want that culture here. That's not who we are. We're a wisdom culture, right? It's awesome. And so here's how we're articulating all of our passions in one little statement, right? All of this gets lived out. All these values get lived out is that our passion is to inspire, equip, and encourage everyday peacemakers. That's how we're wording it. That's what we want to do. That's what we want, the core of how we see ourselves for the next 10 years. Now, how does that start? Well, we want to inspire people into their true self, inspire people to accept their true self, that you are an adopted child of God. The Bible or the Jesus word for this is salvation. Like that, we, we want to inspire you to recognize that you are saved from sin. You're saved from the wounds, the things that have happened to you, the things that if you have happened to others, the guilt, all of that stuff is false self. All that stuff is not real. The real is the love God has for you. The real is that you are an adopted child of God. And all of the ways we talk about that from scripture are metaphors and images to help you get it. And we need new metaphors and images that make sense to our current minds to help us understand that. And so I don't ever want there to be any mistake that that's, that's where it all starts. It all starts with peace with God. And the reason why we don't have peace with God is because we somewhere have fundamentally believed a lie that God doesn't want peace with us the way we are. And that's just not true. 
And so we think that there's some bloodlust in God that has to kill animals so that God can be around us. And it's, it's not, it's a lie. And God, all throughout scripture, is trying to break that. And finally, God takes on flesh to try and break it. And we promptly kill God because we missed it then too, right? But God is just always pouring out love to us. So that's where it starts. We want to inspire. And then we want to equip and encourage all ages to live out the sweet 16. I talked about the sweet 16. I don't have time to go over all those, but we just want to equip people to live it out. Live out these things that Jesus said are the ways of being a peacemaker in the Sermon on the Mount. So here it is, the big, the big vision for the next 10 years. This is where I believe, where we believe a whole bunch of uh, volunteer leaders, a whole bunch of uh, staff that got together and have spent months and months praying and discerning and listening. This is where we believe God is taking us, that we have a vision that by 2031, number one will be a global network that our influence and our connectivity will be around the globe. And I look around this room and you, some of you are from around the globe. Did you know that? Like you have connections all over us and, and you have burdens and passions and we need to be a church that helps fan those into flames. Like where is that? But we, we, we don't believe God's call us just to focus right here in Northern Colorado. I don't believe that's ever been the call of the church. So we'll be a, a, a global network of 5,000 peacemakers, right? Now that's just a number, but it's a number we think that is significant. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But just remember, 5,000 peacemakers, and we're headquartered right here in this building. That's a big deal right now. I just want everybody to know. For us to believe in faith that this building is where we will be in 10 years is a big deal. Because I don't know if you know, we're in a pandemic. (laughs) And everybody is struggling financially. But we have this belief that if we get this in our hearts will be in this building, this campus, and this will be the focal point. This will be a place where amazing work flows out of. It started off as a Northern Colorado statement. And over the last week, I just was burdened with this. No, I'm going to have this statement of faith that, that, that there were sacrifices that were made. And this is the ground that God has given us to do this work. And, and so I'm just believing that. So the 5,000 peacemakers... A global network headquartered right here, contributing. So this is the key word to understand peacemakers, that 5,000 who are contributing. I believe that our touch, the people that are uh, receiving from us, is going to be far more than that. But I'm talking about 5,000 people contributing, giving of themselves, their time. Time Time means you participate in the vision. Right now, everybody in this room, you're participating, you're giving your time. Because there's something inside of you that says, I'll walk out of here more like Jesus not because of me, by the way, but just because this is the experience. So you're tuning in, thinking if I tune in, my life will become more like Jesus. I can make some decisions. I'm going to become equipped to be an everyday peacemaker. So we give our time to that work. It's the consumption. You should be a consumer of your church, right? Again, this is what we say in church growth worlds. Oh, no consumers. We need to have contributors. Nobody should be consuming. Like put your fork and spoon down and start giving. And that's just a way, that's just a way that at times, unfortunately, it gets used to manipulate people to do all the work that needs to be done to grow a nice big church, right? And I'll give you the little dirty little secrets. I, you need to consume it. Like Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Metaphorically, if you're a guest, that's a very weird thing. I get it. But there's a consumption of Christ that we're supposed to do, and that's the role of what we do is we together. So we contribute our time, we come, we participate, and things that actually equip us, right? Then we give our talents. In some way, we give our talents. It means to give our abilities to advance the vision. So there's going to be unique gifts that you have that, yeah, absolutely, you should participate in, in ways, you know, some will be greeters, and some will work with kids, and some will, uh, will, will help care for the facility, and, and some will be musicians, and some will sing, and, and some won't do anything with the gathered church. They'll do all scattered church stuff. That's okay. But you then contribute your, ta- your, your, your talents to go bring wholeness in the world, and then we contribute everybody's favorite, our treasure. I don't know if you know this or not, but you really can't do anything without money, <laughs> Right? Like, you can't have a building without money. You can't. It's just the reality of it. So can everybody just breathe a little bit, right? Like, I'm not afraid to talk about money. I'm not afraid to talk about giving. I love giving. It's just money. And it's great. Like, we can use it to do good things with it. And so everybody, regardless of our time or time, like, we're creating this together by contributing money. Right? There you go. That didn't hurt that much, right? (laughs) Next week will. This one, not so much, Okay. So those are the ways in which we contribute. And so we'll, we'll talk about peacemakers in terms of how we track whether we're actually being successful. 
is people that are contributing in these ways. Not If you're only doing one or the other, we're like, eh, I don't know that that fits yet. But we say a peacemaker is actually engaged in all three of these in some way, shape, or form. And what do we want to contribute? In 10 years, what do we want to contribute? I got to tell you this quick. Man, I got to tell you real quick. We want to contribute 150,000 hours and $10 million into peacemaking around the globe and here in Northern Colorado. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to do in 10 years. 150,000 hours and $10 million. And we want to contribute those into things that inspire, equip, and encourage. And we've got big dreams for the next 10 years. Big dreams for who we are and why we exist. And really, it's a dream that we move away from the the idea of being a local church to being a center for hope and healing that has a part of it is the local church gathering and worship services that are traditional and non-traditional. You know, like if you're this kind of gathering in, 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 in a big room is not for everybody. Right? It, it, you, there's something about your personality. There's something about your history that being in a big crowd like, is not good for you. But we've just said, well, this is how we know if we're really successful is if everybody comes to this room. Like some of you, the pandemic has been the best thing for your faith because you've been able to sit at home, participate, grow, and not have anxiety about walking into a building filled with strangers. Now, why in the world do we create a system and then cling to it as if it's gospel? It seems to me that that's a wonderful thing. Like, and so if, if, if being in this room doesn't promote in you peacemaking, then let's figure out another way. Let's celebrate that and let's fund that. And let's fund things that we don't get benefit from, but others do, right? So things that we dream about in this idea of a center for hope and healing, it's like an early learning center. We know that there are so many families in our community that are desperate need of quality, wonderful, caring childcare. And what if we could do that and begin those sweet 16, right? This way of Jesus, this love of your enemy, right? These types of things at an early age and with families and offer that in a, in a beautiful way. We have such a beautiful building. It'd be such a great thing to do. And we're working on that in the background as a church. We're trying to do that. We want to see us be a global peacemaking nonprofit that's functioning and partnering with people around the globe committed to the same things that we are, fueling them. I believe 100% that Western Christianity has a responsibility to share its wealth with the world. I believe that deeply. I'll throw this out there. One of my big dreams and passions for the last five years of my life is this big dream that I'd be a part of a church that every year we gave away a million dollars that every year we gave away a million dollars to local and global efforts to ending the unacceptables. That that's the heartbeat of it. That's how generous. Like, and that's just cash out the door. Like that's not even programs. That's just like, yes, we're gonna support people that God has put a, bit, a passion, a vision, has given them a place and we wanna fan that and be generous. We have a dream of of an annual global peacemaking conference, two or three days where we all gather together and hear from people in our community, people in our nation, people in our world that are fighting those, those unacceptables. And we celebrate how we're doing it together and we learn from one another and we rejoice in what God is doing. We get a bigger picture. We've talked about summer camps and a retreat center where people can come. And their kids can have an amazing summer. Summer camp has been a huge part of this place. And and there's this vision to see it grow. Again, all grounded in peacemaking. Raising up teenagers who will stand up and fight bullying themselves. Because that's not the way of Jesus. Right? Core values like that. We talk about a vision and a dream for professional services. Like spiritual direction and counseling for those that have been traumatized by a representation of a God that is violent and exclusive. And other realities of our lives. Those are the things that we do as a church. And then I talked about this umbrella for 10 nonprofits that grow up out of our church. That you're sitting there in your heart and all of a sudden there's just this passion. We want to be a church that fuels that passion into existence. You don't need to go out and get a nonprofit number and an accounting department and a marketing department and a copy machine and an office. We have all this shared space here for our affiliates. You come in and you can use it and we'll run that and help you with your payroll and take care of all that stuff so you can focus on what God's called you to do. And we do that together. So here it is. This is what we're talking about. By 2020, 31, excuse me, 21. Yeah, we're going to get it done quick. (laughs) We're just going to receive an offering and be done, right? So here's what we want to do. We want to be a global network of 5,000 peacemakers headquartered right here at Taft Avenue, contributing 150,000 hours and $10 million into peacemaking. And I believe that will make the world a better place. 
I believe that we can say that our gathering and our work is necessary. And I will gladly give the rest of my life to that. Being a part of that, personally, just being a part of that. Because at the end, we'll be welcoming the orphans. <laughs> well, not just the spiritual orphans, but we'll be welcoming the orphans. We will, be, we will be doing the good work of good religion to care for the widows and the orphans of our world. And we'll ultimately be bringing this kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of freedom to our world. Freedom. Who the Son has set free is free indeed, free from the lies of this world, free from an understanding that God is distant and, and can't stand to be around us because of our sin, free from the lie that you're of no value because of your immigration status, free from the lie that your sexuality means God doesn't love you and God can't use you, freedom from all of these lies, freedom for everybody. The big question we have in front of us is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And we're going to talk about that next week. But right now, will you grab your communion cup and we're going to play this video and have communion together. Please open the, the communion and take it as you want to during this song. What's God inviting you into today? I, I hope that God, you hear God inviting you into this, this big vision and God inviting you into this next year, how you can be a part of it through our Peace is Worth the Emphasis, what that means. We're gonna talk about that next week. And I hope and I pray that you will hear God whisper, I need to, I need to attend next week. I need to tune in next week. I don't know how we're gonna do this. And I recognize that this is probably one of the foolish things is to lay this out and then bring people to a place of commitment on the Sunday after Thanksgiving in the middle of a community going into red. But I believe in my heart of hearts that nothing, nothing apart from us can stop what God wants to do in this world through us. And if we'll make that commitment, God will do more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so whether that's tuning in live, whether that's showing up here next week, whether it's watching it on demand, I hope that you are hearing God invite you to understand what's being asked of us as a community of faith for the next year so that nothing, nothing can stop what God wants to do, not even a pandemic, not even a pandemic. So as we sing this song, as you receive communion, here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about and see it like this. Jesus is oftentimes referred to as the light of the world. As you take the bread and the cup, imagine light entering into you, that you're absorbing and you're receiving and letting light into you. If you're at home and you've got a bagel, some orange juice or a mimosa, whichever, you're imagining and understanding that I'm consuming light, I'm bringing light into me and then when I leave my home or when I leave this building, I'm gonna keep that light shining through me. That's the point, this nourishment of Jesus in my life, this light that shines of peace and wholeness in this world. And I'm gonna let it break into this darkness through me. And this love will cause me to see that we can all be free. And that's the lyric of this song I want you to think about as you have communion. We as a church are daring to believe that we can create a world where we'll all be free. And it might not be in my generation, and it might not be in the next, but maybe it's the next, or maybe it's the next. But God's called us to this moment, and we dare to believe that we can all be free. So just have a moment, think through, and I'll be back to pray for you and get you out of here on this morning where I've kept you way too long.
So let the light in, keep it shining. Let it make it to the darkness. All the love dancers to see, we'll all be free. In these desperate times, love will hold us here. Love will join our hands, teach us to have no so we lay our hate down to wash their feet when we see our brother oh we'll all be free yes we'll all be free so let the light in, keep it shining let it break into the darkness all the love dancers to see we'll all you tune off in a minute. I'm going to pray for you. Before we do that, if you have a prayer request today, you'd like for somebody to pray with you. We'll have some folks that uh, just love to pray with people. They'll be up here. And when we finish, you're welcome to come and just share. Maybe you have a challenge in your life. I would say challenges are good and bad uh, things that happen to us. So it's not just something bad. You have a great challenge. You're entering I don't know, retirement or you're some great, wonderful thing. You're getting ready to have a baby. I don't know if you know that or not. That's a challenge. <laughs> was for me. Well, more for my wife, I suppose. But So I just want to encourage you, if you have, we're here in prayer for you. Um, you can, uh, your offering this morning, your giving. Thank you again for your generosity. You can do that online or text if you're at home. The envelope, the offering envelope, you can use that here in the room or at home, actually. It's all the postage is paid. Just drop it in the mail or drop it in the orange uh, Hope is Here box. We put Hope is Here on the orange boxes, by the way, because that's why we give. Our giving brings hope. It was pretty intentional. We want, I want you to know that. When I give every month, I believe that it's bringing hope into the world. So thank you for that. If you have a prayer request too, and you're at home and you'd like somebody to pray for you, you can text prayer uh, to the number there, or you can just click on the live prayer button if you're on the online campus. And then Finally, we mentioned Advent is coming up, Advent, and uh, we're going to be journeying as a church if you want to on the side. I'm going to do the drops of hope that I do every morning uh, through uh, Walter Brueggemann's book, Celebrating Abundance, uh, which is like a devotion. If you're interested in this, you can order it online or if you'd like to pick it up, it's out in the lobby. Uh, obviously, if you're at home, it's, it's weird to go to the lobby, so just go online and grab it, but if you want it, it's there as well. Uh, would you do me a favor and stand up today? We're going to get out of here just a second. I'd love to just bless you, and you've been sitting a long time. Make sure you thank, uh, if you have kids, make sure you thank the children's uh, team uh, for not getting mad at me for how long it was today. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. Let me pray for you. May God bless you, and may love keep you. May wisdom cause its face to shine upon you. May you experience the goodness of God. 
May you know that hope has a name, Jesus. And may you know that the greatest days are ahead, that a foundation has been built for our church that is beautiful and wonderful, and we would never be able to go where God is calling us without it. And may that produce joy and energy in you. And may you be fueled by the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. May it be a light inside of you that shines into the darkness that God has placed you to bring his grace and mercy in your everyday normal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome week. Have a great Thanksgiving. And we'll see you in some way next week. Shout.